All righty. Well, um, my name's Adam Keena. It's always a somewhat of a awkward situation where I haven't in here. my audience or uh, um, really don't get to see you. I am going to um, blank my my video for the the duration of the talk, but obviously come back online on on video uh, for question time and, and so forth. But um, got a lot of material to cover. Thanks so much for the the invitation. Um, so I'm going to stop the video there and, and I'm assuming you can all still see the, the slide deck. Um, and yeah, so so thanks for uh, inviting me to speak about this very important topic. Um, uh, so, you know, risk of sudden cardiac death, um, athlete or not, is a topic that's really near and dear to my heart, pun intended, um, and it's to a certain extent how I got interested in pursuing a career as a pediatric heart rhythm specialist. Um, this, of course, is a large topic, and I prepared a good amount of material uh, content, um, but hopefully still allowed enough uh, time for discussion. Uh, and move forward. Excellent. Um, so no real relevant conflicts of interest uh, to disclose uh, related to this topic at all. Um, so without further ado, the objectives for today uh, include the following. We're going to discuss the public health imperative of sudden cardiac arrest rest in athletes um, and to a certain extent uh, non-athletes uh, in the pediatric and young adult population. We're going to discuss common diagnoses responsible for sudden cardiac arrest. We're then going to go uh, and take a bit of a detour into defining what a screening program is. Um, I'm sure a lot of you are aware of uh, ECG and echo screenings, and we're going to um, sort of take a deep dive into that. We're going to frame the debate of ECG screening um, by way of a brief literature review. Uh, and then uh, we're going to move on to acknowledging the limitations of our current data set. Um, and it's been that way, uh, even though we've got a huge amount of data over the past 10 to 20 years, it's still uh, somewhat limited in the United States, particularly. Uh, and then finally, we're going to really talk about an approach uh, to caring for our community, which is really what we're here and all about. Um, so the take home, you know, if you want to just sort of put on the, uh, the earmuffs and, and blinders after this slide, you're, you're gonna be okay. Cause really this is what I want you to, to take from today's talk. Sudden cardiac death uh, in an athlete is a very attractive and often emotional topic. It involves an entire communities and indeed nations needing to rectify uh, its conscience around the, this notion that, you know, the athlete is a picture of health and beauty and, and remains at risk for a, cardiac, a catastrophic life uh, ending disease. This is not the picture of uh, you know, someone who's ill in the hospital. Superstars uh, at times in full view of public have their life cut short. So for those of you who don't know uh, the basketball players, uh, I, I focused on basketball given the, uh, the Indiana population, but uh, um, there are all, you know, examples in, in any sport. Um, so you've got, you know, Pete Maravich um, from, you know, he's, a, this is his picture as a college student at LSU, but he had a, actually a full college as well as professional career before he died in his 40s after retirement due to a single right coronary artery. Reggie Lewis, on the cover of Sports Illustrated here, uh, died due to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, uh, and then uh, we'll show a video actually uh, of Hank Gathers who was in the prime of his collegiate career um, when he uh, went down and he actually had a diagnosis um, but was not taking medicine because of how it made him feel and was giving the blessing to do so by his healthcare providers. So these events, ironically, much more uh, than higher frequency event, have brought about a significant push to devise strategies to make them stop. I mean, you, you've got these uh, episodes um, and uh, it becomes obviously headline news uh, in, on the cover of magazines. So the four things that I want you to take from today are as follows. I want you to perform comprehensive history and physical examinations per the American Heart Association guidelines. I want you to consider a very low threshold for ECG 
uh, evaluation, but be mindful of the implications of that. Uh, you don't want to just shotgun approach um, evaluation for every single individual that comes in your office. Um, you want to educate the family and the community. This is part of our responsibility. It's not just to see individuals. It's to actually interface with our community. Um, this is what it means. And I, you know, you guys could teach this better than I can uh, to take care of whole families and whole communities. But ultimately, you need to be ready for emergencies because they're going to they're going to happen. Um, you know, my my goal in my career is to be able to identify the needle in the haystack, so to speak, and so that these events never even come about, but I'm humble enough to know that I'm not going to be able to do that for everyone. And we need to have a plan um, for when that does occur. So we're going to move forward on a couple of videos, even though my take home slides really what I want you to remember, my suspicion is you're going to remember these uh, better than anything. And I, I want you to focus. So this is actually the video of Hank Gathers dying on the basketball court in 1990. So I'm going to stop talking real quick and just sort of let you take it in. So this is uh, at a college basketball game. And Hank Gathers is one of the top basketball players uh, in the entire country. And you're gonna see him dunking the ball right here. Um, and you're gonna see really what it means. This is just a replay of that for unexplained syncope. This is the image of sudden cardiac arrest that I want you to get in your your mind when you see a patient who comes in with vasovagal symptoms, it is not this. This is what you need to be mindful of. So at this point, his entire heart is in ventricular fibrillation. And of course, you're seeing seizure-like activity or really seizure activity because of uh, in, uh, insufficient perfusion to the cerebral um, tissue. Uh, and at this point, what they're doing, of course, is seizure care, right? If you see a patient seize, you get them into a safe position so that they don't ask their secretions, but they're completely ignoring the cause of the seizure. And I'm not going to have you watch the entire thing. His parents come down and it's incredibly sad, but I'm going to skip to the end here. And what you're going to see is something that really gets many of us fired up. He's in a stretcher at this point. People are carrying him off the court. And this is a man carrying a defibrillator. And no one has tried to use this the entire time. Now, this is not an AED, mind you. Um, uh, but at no point was there an attempt to resuscitate. And this was a patient who, uh, or an individual rather, who uh, had a known cardiac issue. Um, what's obviously it was astonishing back in 1990, and I'll be happy to discuss it more because a lot of us who are a bit older remember that in real time. But now we're at 2018. This is two years ago. And I want you to focus here in the lower left uh, section of the, of the video screen. There is another video on, um, on YouTube, but it wouldn't let me um, borrow it for this presentation where it actually shows the reverse. And you can see uh, this professional athlete, uh, Zeke Upshaw, go down. But if you just focus your attention to the left lower screen, you're going to see the exact same thing. A win and they're automatically in. Whitehead, quickly. Trying to move on so here he is stumbling. And he's just on the ground. This is two years ago. And watch what happens. Player down and Zeke Upshaw is on his stomach. I did not see the contact. And he's being tended to on the far side in the right corner. I've seen a little bit of movement. Which is a lie. There was no movement. <laughs> feet moving back and forth and uh so again i'm not going to perseverate on this but two minutes of video we'll take it to the end no one has applied a defibrillator to this patient or this individual and cutting to the chase he died so these are the things that get us fired up needless to say so today 
in addition to hopefully just remembering those video clips, um, we are going to talk about how these patients come to your office. Most commonly, you're not gonna see this patient who survived a sudden cardiac arrest. We will often see them in the hospital at that, but that is a presentation, of course. Um, you will see either a family member of someone who experienced sudden cardiac arrest, someone who comes into your office concerning about palpitations, pretty common complaint I would imagine you're familiar with, chest pain, not uncommon, dizziness, syncope, but most commonly, I would imagine, though you would know better than I, you're gonna see someone come in with a, a pre-participation evaluation. Can they play sports? So they're gonna be well and completely asymptomatic. So now you're sitting there with these videos in mind going, okay, well, what do I do about them? And then, so here comes the list. Um, you know, this is the morning report list. Someone comes in with a question of, um, possible sudden cardiac arrest or concern for sudden cardiac arrest, what are the diagnoses you need to think of? And this is when, you know, your hopefully your eyes aren't glazing over and going, oh my God, I've got to know about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, arrhythmogenic uh, right cardiodysplasia, cardiomyopathy, dilated cardiomyopathy, all the other cardiomyopathies, congenital anomalies, aortopathies, valvular heart disease, congenital long QT syndrome, CPVT, WPW, Brugada, atherosclerotic disease, Kawasaki's, myocarditis, commodio cordis, acquired QT prolongation, you know, say they're on an SSRI or um, uh, other, or some other environmental in ingestion. These are all the diagnoses you've got to be experts at, right? Which is completely absurd if you think about it. Um, and again, the, the purpose of this discussion today is not to go over each and every one of these diagnoses, because that's well beyond the scope of our discussion, but to know that there are a lot of things that can cause what just happened on those videos. So fortunately, to a certain extent, your evaluation can be relatively streamlined. First and foremost, you have your medical history and physical examination. Of course, if you've got a murmur that jumps out at you, um, or if they say, oh yeah, you know, I passed out while I was on the basketball court in full sprint and it looked just like that, you know you've got an issue on your hand. But more commonly than not, it's going to be a whole lot of donuts and everything's easy, or sorry, everything's uh, normal. So then the question is, do you move on to a 12 lead ECG or an echocardiogram? And this is when it gets hard. Um, you know, it's real easy just to start shotgunning these things. Yeah, I mean, why not move on to an MRI, a stress test? And regardless of cost of all these things, you know, we do live in a very wealthy nation. And even though a lot of people can afford these things, one, it's the wrong way to practice. And we'll talk about why that is in a moment. But two, it does cost an an awful lot of money. Um, so you need to stop and pump, pump the brakes a little bit. Um, it's not reasonable for every person who comes in your office for a pre-participation evaluation, uh, whether they're an athlete or not, you know, they could just be, you know, very anxious before a a math test and just as easily drop dead if they've got hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So what we're doing to a certain extent is working backwards. We're performing diagnostics to assess for a specific disease risk that may have many causes. In order to approach this correctly, that is with autonomy, justice, beneficence, and uh, non-malfeasance. You know, these are the cornerstones of medical ethics. Don't forget that. We need to know the starting risk, right? We need to know the pretest probability. Um, if everyone's healthy, you're not going to get all these evaluations. There's no evidence to support that. So let's take a quick digression. You know, so these are the 10 leading causes of death by age group uh, in the United States per CDC in 2018. It's a, we're probably going to get 2020 data uh, in the next uh, four to six months, but these are the, the most current data. And what I'm going to bring your attention to are in the red circles. So the red circles identify heart disease with the numbers below detailing the total deaths. So, you know, if you look at this, you know, so these are the rank one through 10, and then these are the age groups in the in the columns. So the total, of course, are all the deaths that were described for heart disease, and it doesn't describe the total deaths in, in the nation um, for each of these. Um, but what I'd like you to uh, sort of keep in mind is, and, and this is coming from a, a heart specialist who really, you know, loves this patient population and is doing everything I can to minimize their risk, 
the risk of our patients in less than one year, one to four, five to nine, 10, 14, and 15, all the way up to 24 years of age is minuscule compared to unintentional injury. So these are, you know, gunshot wounds. These are motor vehicle collisions, minuscule compared to suicides once we get to 10 to 14 years of age and 15 to 24 years of age. Homicides is obviously even a secondary issue. And then you get uh, malignant neoplasms and so forth. Congenital anomalies are, of course, can include heart disease, but generally speaking, um, for the purposes of this graph, they don't. But the take home is that, <laughs> Even though you have these stories in the newspaper and videos that you just saw, the likelihood of anyone coming into your office having a high risk for any of these things is still incredibly low. That doesn't mean we ignore it, and that's what we're going to talk about the entire day today, or not the entire day, but certainly during your lunch. Um, but I don't want you to, to perseverate on the notion that this is... Uh, you know, low-lying fruit, you know, the low-lying fruit is still this stuff up here. So make sure that you're, you know, you're really, uh, you know, focusing on the primary care that you're, that you're charged to deliver. And, you know, that's not just uh, an audience indulgence, you know, obviously you guys are the, uh, the experts on this and you're not going to forget that, but, but bear that in mind. So moving on back to sudden cardiac death in, in what we're talking about, the first uh, individual really to blow the, the roof off this back in, in the 80s was Barry Marin over at the uh, University of Minnesota. So he has detailed a, uh, a registry for uh, sudden cardiac arrest and really focused on the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy population, but uh, has included others as well. And this paper back in 1986 was the first to detail the... Oops, sorry, the difference between those under 35 years of age and over 35 years of age. So again, not necessarily a pediatric population, but really young adults versus older adults. And this is what was so interesting is that in the young population, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy approached cl close to half the population. In contrast to those older than 35 years of age, overwhelming, you know, more than three quarters, really four fifths of the population was, was coronary artery disease. Now, admittedly, this is an old study. So this is long before all the smoking um, primary care uh, initiatives went into effect and so forth, but it's still fairly representative. And this is uh, really what comes into the forefront when we're talking about um, how we deal with this. So in his 50 plus career, and he's still working, um, uh, he's educated us about hypertroph hypertrophic cardiomyopathies and the primary role in this population, though in the setting of our largely fragmented healthcare system, we've failed to really categorically describe the true prevalence of this disease that we've tried, and this is what we're moving forward on. So this is um, the debate that I'm going to frame with four studies in the coming slides, first from the question of incidence and prevalence, and then what has become a central debate and that is to screen, and if so, how, or not to screen. When we are discussing rare events such as these, the numerators really loom large. You know, these are the, the patients who we see in the news, but the denominators are largely unknown, and this is what belies the importance. So in the 20 years following uh, Dr. Uh, Marin's paper, Dr. Corrado from uh, Italy published uh, his landmark study in 2006 in JAMA. Um, and what they described was a nearly 90% reduction in sudden cardiac death in competitive athletes. Um, and the number, and I'll show you the graph in a second, but he, what he described going from 3.6 um, events per 100,000 uh, uh, individuals, so a numerator of 3.6, denominator of 100,000, going down to 0 0.4 uh, with the introduction of a screening protocol. The primary concerns um, really in, in chewing through this data had nothing to do with um, the ratio and the and the decline, but was the relatively high uh, incidence of these events. So 3.6 per 100,000 is a lot higher than what we experience here in the United States, and we'll talk about why that is. Um, the denominator is just obviously a normalization. 
The reason that numerator was so high is in the Veneto region of Italy or in and around Venice and Padua and what have you, they have a very high incidence of one of those diseases called rhythmogenic right cardiomyopathy, which is not unheard of, but much, much less common in the United States. So it's difficult, as you well know, um, not that this is a a course on how to read the medical literature, but to extrapolate one population to another. So three years later, of course, uh, Barry Marin published somewhat of a rebuttal, but basically to say, you know, all right, that's fine for Italy, but let's see what the United States has to say. And he demonstrated a relatively flat and actually increased somewhat during that time. Now we didn't have a screening protocol, but what he measured was 0.6, um, deaths per 100,000. And that's in contrast to the decrease from 3.6 to 0 0.4. And, and I'll show you all of these uh, in the coming moments. I just sort of want to set the stage for what we're going to talk about. A more recent study, and this was completed by a, uh, a family uh, practitioner who's really a sports uh, 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 specialist um, named Jonathan Dresner out of Seattle, um, showed that in a five-year review of NCAA athletes, it could actually be even higher, up to 32 per 100,000. So hopefully in discussing these, you're getting a feel for how widely variable that numerator is. Um, and that's ultimately the crux of what we've got to figure out. And then we've got this last study that I'm, I'm going to introduce that involves Israel. Again, a very small uh, country that is bearing little resemblance to any of the other populations, but they also introduced an ECG screening um, program, but did something interesting in their study and looked at a large amount of data before versus after. So in order to really talk about screening in general, we need to really have the same definition and starting place. So let's, uh, let's talk about that as a, as a real brief tangent. So the definition of screening that I want you to keep in mind is as follows, and this is from uh, medical screening in the workplace and really uh, the occupational health uh, literature. And it's the application of an examination, historical question or laboratory test to apparently healthy individuals with the goal of detecting early pathology before the individual would normally seek, excuse me, seek clinical care for symptomatic diseases. So the, again, this is, is from 1986, but it holds true, right? This is the, the patient who comes into your office who wants to play basketball and is otherwise fine. The criteria though for medical screening, and this is from 1990, is the acceptable performance of a medical screening test depends on the prevalence of a disease in the population as well as the risk of toxicity and consequences of false positive test results in that population. So we're adding on a couple of different things now. So all of a sudden we are recognizing that screening tests are not benign. In other words, we could screen people with a blood test, but now you got to stick a needle in them. You could screen people with, you know, a lobotomy, but now you're carving out part of their brain. I mean, obviously that's tongue in cheek. The key though is to recognize that there is some risk associated with screening tests in, in, What's more is there is a risk for a, a false positive. So if you've identified someone as having a disease, but they actually don't have that disease, you've potentially changed their life in incredibly meaningful ways. So an example of a realistic screening test is newborn screening, right? So you have someone, uh, a baby that's born and they get newborn screened for, you know, Tay-Sachs and various other, Tay-Sachs and other diseases. You know, yes, it is a, it is a, a a pinprick to, to a child and no one wants to see an infant in pain, but the benefits of being able to figure out whether or not they've got PKU or various other um, life-threatening and catastrophic diseases far outweighs the risk of that pinprick. So we do it. So the, the criteria is met. Um, so along those lines, what are the criteria? So additional criteria for screening tests Want, first and foremost, they have to be accept, they have to have acceptable sensitivity, specificity, and ultimately predictive value. If your screening test misses a whole bunch of people or the false positive rate is through the roof, then it's not worth it. It doesn't matter how cheap it is, you're gonna be sending yourself down rabbit holes. It's gotta be valid and reliable. You know, if you do it in one population, 
it has to be extrapolated to another population. You can't just do this in inner city Indianapolis and expect that if you do this in the outlying countryside, if it gives different results, then that's no good. It's got to be able to identify disease early and lead to treatment that impedes disease progression. There is no point in screening someone for Alzheimer's disease if they're six months from dying from it, okay? You haven't helped anyone, um, so that's not gonna be valuable. There needs to be adequate follow-up, further diagnostic tests, and effective management of the disease must be available, accessible, and acceptable. If you have a disease, and now we're starting to get, of course, into a little bit of controversy, but if you have a genetic disease um, where there is really no treatment, there's no hope for altering the course, and really what you're talking about is the standard of care is observation regardless. Doing a screening test has, at least according to our definition, no merit. Um, now, it could have merit for the family, of course, but for the patient itself, there's really no benefit. So that's where, uh, you know, we do tow a, a fine line. But ultimately, the last is the benefits of the screening program must outweigh the costs. As a society, again, if we're going to think about medical ethics, if a screening program costs us $1 million per patient, we're going to bankrupt the treasury um, for a relative benefit, again, going back to that potentially low-lying fruit, do you want to spend a million dollars per patient looking for my patients who have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or WPW, or do you want to give that million dollars to smoking cessation, uh, battling motor vehicle collisions, various other things that are wiping out our patient population at much quicker um, volumes? So all of these things need to be taken into account. So, all right. So let's pump the brakes a bit again. Um, we might be getting just a little too academic here, right? Because if we come back to what we're talking about, we're talking about ECGs or EKGs. We know that they don't cause pain. We know that they're not expensive. Um, you know, obviously, depending where you get them done, the cost can vary. Um, and we know that in addition to a history and physical, they're going to allow us to assess for disease a whole lot more specifically than without that. So is there any reason not to use that um, in this day and age? And what I hope to, to leave you with, um, you know, certainly by the end of the uh, presentation is that that's the exact same thing that a lot of uh, organizations have asked with, with the reasonable result is as follows. Many organizations, communities, and nations have gone ahead with screening programs without data to categorically um, satisfy all of those screening criteria. Evidence for screening is largely based on the Italian experience, which we'll talk about in, in greater detail, with loose validation from other countries. Opposition evidence is largely based on Marin's group from Minnesota. And the U.S. currently has no such national policy. So in 1996, as well as in uh, 2013, the AHA has re recommended a 12-point screening history based on history and physical. But that doesn't mean that these communities or NGOs advocating and underwriting screening programs doing ECGs are in the wrong. In Simon, so that there's a program called Simon's Heart, which is a national program started in Philadelphia, and there are um, uh, branches all over uh, the country, as well as uh, I think a small branch in Indiana, where they do um, do limited EC, sorry, ECG screening as well as limited echocardiography um, for the benefit of certain patients um, at, at certain schools and what have you. Um, and news programs and Twitter feeds have featured arrhythmia specialists advocating these programs, you know, with the notion of what if this was your child. Um, and this can be confusing to the public. And then this is where we come into our advocacy that we do need to toe the line and not certainly bash these programs because they're out to help the patient population as much as anything, but to put them in context. That is, we don't want to vilify other schools who don't necessarily offer them as long as you know, we can toe the line and know that we're all on the same side and trying to promote the health and welfare of our patient. So let's look at this data then that I keep referencing. 
So the Corrado study, this is the primary graph that you'll see emblazoned over pretty much all the presentations at the American Heart Association, the Heart Rhythm Society, the American College of Cardiology, and presumably other large organizations. What he showed was starting in 1979-1980, uh, the entire Italian population underwent screening um, from ages 12 to 35. And I'm again, not gonna go into the minutia of the, of the data, um, but this was not just ECG screening. They actually went through an entire exercise treadmill. I mean, it was a large program where they had sports uh, cardiologists specifically designed, uh, or sorry, sports cardiologist clinics that were specifically designed to do these in sort of a, a cookie cutter, um, um, industrial way uh, that was very uh, effective. And what they showed was that they had a drop in uh, sudden cardiac arrest episodes from the early 80s all the way through into the mid 2000s. Again, starting at four deaths per 100,000 person years. And then the comparison of course was the unscreened non-athletes. So now not only are they showing that their screening program was beneficial, but they got them to where actually even lower into the early mid 2000s than the non-screened or sorry, unscreened non-athletes, um, which also raised obviously ethical considerations. Um, you know, you've got your unscreened population here, how come you're ignoring them? Um, and this is something that would fly in the face of uh, a lot of us um, who obviously uh, take uh, medical ethics seriously. Um, so Sammy Viskin's group uh, looked at both Corrado's data and I'll, and I'll show you um, Marin's data in a second um, and asked the question, well, so we started a program too, and, and they actually did theirs in the 1990s as opposed to, in the, that is the late 1990s as opposed to the late 1970s. So it was more modern data, but they also did something interesting. They asked the question, well, what happened before here? In other words, you've got a point in time at 3.5 and 4 person years, but was it always up here? Um, or did it maybe was it decreased and you just happened to pick out a couple of really bad years and showed an effect that may have been true, true and unrelated to the ECG study or the ECG intervention. Um, so what they did was a validation study of sorts. Um, the author's primary contention is that the longer pre-screening time period is necessary to compare the results of a post-screening era. Um, so of course, to review, Israel is a small, relatively wealthy country and they really wanted to catch everyone, and they had the ability to do that given their small population and wealth. Um, the recognized extent of the overly cautious screening program um, really minimized the likelihood of a very few false negatives as well. Um, so their methods were, I mean, their program included a history, physical, resting ECG, a Bruce protocol treadmill test, um, and th that was at the onset, and then they uh, even continued the HMP and ECG annually for uh, every four years, and they compared sudden cardiac death incidents in equal time periods before and after mandatory screening. Um, so they were able to define their numerator, define their denominator, counting both of those effectively um, in all competitive athletes. Now, again, this was just restricted to athletes only. Um, and what they found was as follows. They had um, a research staff that scoured the newspapers, everything, and they got pretty much as far as they could detect every single athlete um, who died during that period, starting in the mid 80s all the way into the mid 2000s. Sudden death was defined as a witness instantaneous death with futile resuscitation and cardiac arrest was an instantaneous collapse with successful resuscitation. Sudden death related to trauma was excluded, of course, so motor vehicle collision. So they you know, could always underestimate a little bit if you had someone who had an event that led to a motor vehicle collision. The numerator listed here was uh, 24 over the entire time period. 12 deaths were excluded due to trauma and non-cardiac causes, as well as predating the study. Uh, coaches, referees, former athletes, all were male. The denominator was determined by the National Registry, so 45,000 in 2009 and extrapolated back. Um, so 
this is what they found. And there's two lines here, obviously. There's the solid line as the dotted line. The solid line is the actual data. And the dotted line um, was uh, sort of a parametric bootstrap is what I like to call it. They recognize fully, as I'm sure you do as well, there's a lot more people exercising in 2007, 2008 than were back in 85 and 86. You know, the sort of the athletic revolution uh, happened with Nike and Adidas and all these companies, you know, people were getting a lot more fit. So you want to compare apples to apples as best you can. So they estimate that the true incidence of sudden cardiac arrest was probably higher than their actual data if all of these people were exercising, which they weren't. But what they showed categorically, even with that bootstrap, so to speak, falsely or inappropriately or appropriately, depending on your uh, perspective, elevating the risk beforehand, showed that when they started their screening protocol here, they happened to, for whatever reason, have a much higher risk than even the years beforehand. So had they dropped their line here and started their ECG screening program, they would have shown the same thing Corrado did, which was a successful study, but they would have been fooled because they didn't have those deaths beforehand, even without an ECG screening study. And this is just a quick bar graph showing during that same time period, 1980 to 2006, during Corrado's data in the United States, we actually showed that increase um, in contrast to what was shown. So this is, you know, it, it's sort of an awkward color scheme that they chose, but uh, that's how they published it. Um, these are all of the graphs superimposed. So here we have Corrado's data sort of spread out. You'll recognize the onset of the screening program, the Italian sport law going from three to four per 100,000 coming down to the very low level. Here you have the long promised um, data from Marin's group, so 1985 to the mid-2000s, showing that we were at 0.6 to start with, no screening program initiated. Yeah, there's a small increase, but at no point did we get above 1.5, which is more or less around where Corrado was. And then if you look at the Israeli study, they're starting at a higher point. They peaked as high as eight, so really high even higher than the Italian law, they started their sports screening law here and came down essentially to the same level that we are in the United States. So no one's have been able to really show uh, or re-demonstrate Corrado's data getting it way down to that 0.4. Um, so again, sort of taking home, is that ECG screening, pro screening program on a national level really having the effect that it says it does? So now we're gonna go uh, into that last study that I uh, mentioned regarding uh, uh, Dr. Dresner out at Seattle. So we're left with those three studies. In the next few slides, um, we're going to look at uh, Dresner's group and what they've been able to put together. Now, he's really put together a powerhouse research program that has been uh, studying with a goal of improving the safety of young athletes, and most notably in the NCAA. So in, this is a study from 2011. Again, now we're getting more contemporary, um, where he was able to show pretty categorically that the risk in the NCAA athlete is much, much higher than the risk in all of those other groups. And in certain individuals, so in African-American uh, basketball players, he measured upwards of 32 deaths per 100,000 individuals, um, which is about 50 times the national data from Barry Marin's group. Um, so, again, I, I want to take a quick pause when we look at this pie graph, um, because, again, from a public health perspective, and hopefully you all appreciate this as, as family um, providers, um, the number one thing, however, to take out an NCAA athlete is still an accident, okay? We are looking at accidents at over 50%. Cardiac is, of course, a very large portion, and this is what we're focusing on today, but there are still a huge number, almost 10% of these individuals, and if you combine it, suicides and homicides, more individuals or about as many individuals are going down because of cardiac issues than are going down by human-based intervention, suicide and homicides in and of themselves. So if we can just look at accidents and these, we're going to have a huge impact. 
So moving forward, um, after seeing all of that data, there was a huge public outcry, of course. Um, and the question was, okay, if we institute a ECG screening, screening program in high school, because in NCAA, and I don't know if you're aware of this, all of the all NCAA athletes are getting a high level evaluation. They're getting ECGs, they're getting, in most cases, echocardiograms, they're getting the creme de la creme of, of evaluation. But obviously our high school students are not. So the question is, if we start doing that evaluation at a younger age, can we detect more? So um, this group sought to, uh, to evaluate that. So um, they evaluated 2017 athletes um, uh, and they, ha they achieved five primary outcomes, one with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and four individuals with full Parkinson-White syndrome. They had a false positive rate of around 15, uh, excuse me, 14.5 percent from a history and physical alone, and of course a decreased false positive of only 2.8 percent with the ECG. Um, uh, sorry, so the question is, you know, really categorically, even whether you're doing an ECG or not, you are excluding close to three percent of your population uh, with just an ECG, and if you're doing an HMP with 14.5% of the population for five primary outcomes. Now, you know, none of us, particularly myself, are going to argue that that's wasted effort, you know, saving, or not saving, because I don't want to get too dramatic, but identifying an individual with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and four individuals with full Parkinson-White syndrome is obviously important, but we've also sidelined a huge number of individuals as a result of that effort. And that's got to be taken into account when you're thinking about all of your student athletes who are no longer able to play. Um, they're missing their football season. They're missing their basketball season until they can get in to see uh, either me or uh, someone similar to adjudicate these results further. Um, so the follow up to this then is, okay, well, should we look at a direct comparison? And this is a study that actually just came out uh, a couple months ago um, to try to get us contemporarily as best as possible. There was a whole outcry in terms of um, cost related to these things. You know, you've got echocardiograms. Okay, well, let's cut the echo out and let's just look at the ECG. And what they were able to show is that ECGs alone were more sensitive and sorry, six times more sensitive and five times more cost effective per diagnosis. And this is what the data looks like. So these were the individuals that they identified in a high school screening program. And what I'll point out here is a, a couple really important findings. And, and this is one of the, uh, if you look at the editorials that came out in this publication, it addressed this, um, that when you're really trying to compare e to ECG screen or to not ECG screen, what you want to compare is whether the history is normal and the physical exam is normal and you have an abnormal ECG. That's what you want to focus on. And when we look at just those individuals, obviously we're going to eliminate these kiddos because you're going to find those with what you're doing currently with your HMP. Um, and if you just focus on your nose in this column, as well as the nose in this column, that's where we want to focus on. And what you'll see is that all of the patients who were identified with this ECG screening protocol were Wolf Parkinson White patients, with the one exception of this hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patient. So they identified one patient who is at a very high likelihood of having a sudden cardiac arrest. And I don't wanna poo poo the, the finding of WPW too much because this is, I mean, my population is near and dear to me um, because I, you know, we, we want to identify those individuals, but the risk for dying suddenly in the Wolf Parkinson White population is about on par with getting hit by lightning. Um, the risk for someone dying from hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is much, much higher. And this is sort of now going back to 2013 um, with what I think is sort of the, the last uh, paper that uh, Barry Marin really put out on our specific topic today that's important is highlighted right here. 
in the high school athlete, the population risk of cardiovascular sudden death was small on the range of one in 150,000 participants per year. Based on an autopsy data alone, 30% of sudden cardiac deaths were due to diseases that would not be reliably detected by pre-participation screening or even a 12 lead ECG. So these are the kiddos who have uh, anomalous coronary artery disease, who have um, problems that may have been detected on their echocardiogram, but not just with their ECG. So you say, wait a minute, you know, weren't we talking about, you know, that zero point six out of 100,000 to, you know, going from 3.6 to zero point. So we're throwing out numbers left and right. So I, I want to make sure that we're talking about the same thing. What we saw previously was how many out of 100,000. This is a ratio, of course, an odds, one out of 150,000 participants um, per year. So in Dresner's data, what he was looking at were not people who were dying. These were diagnoses that were made. And I don't want you to equate, even though it's easy to do so and important to have a healthy respect for these diseases though, but if you diagnose someone with Wolf Parkinson White syndrome, that is not a death sentence. That is a call to arms that we need to evaluate that patient and likely cure them, but it doesn't mean that they are necessarily going to die. And what we are most concerned with, um, you know, even though I love taking care of those patients, if I could tell you with 100% accuracy, meaning 100% specificity and sensitivity, which WPW and which HCM patients were going to have a sudden cardiac arrest and which weren't, that's all I would care about. You know, yeah, I love taking these patients to ablation and curing them, but if someone doesn't need an ablation because they were never going to have a sudden cardiac arrest, I'm sure they would much prefer not to have that ablation. Um, so that's why really taking into account these numbers are really important. And this is, you know, part of this consideration. So Dana Vollmer, um, this is back in 2000, she was the youngest swimmer to compete in the 2000 Olympic trials. During her evaluation uh, for those trials, she was diagnosed with SVT and possible long QT syndrome. Cutting to the quick, she didn't have long QT syndrome, but she completely missed out on the 2000 Olympics. She missed out on the 2006 Olympics, but eventually once these were adjudicated, she was able to perform and she won uh, two gold or sorry, three gold medals and set two world records of the 2012 games. So these screening tests do have, um, you know, real, real fallout that we want to take into account. Um, and, you know, regardless, you know, this is back in, in Dresner's camp and, you know, he puts out phenomenal data and this is, you know, a, a paper that many of us are really uh, pointing to that regardless of how well our screening programs are, that school-based AED programs are really the key to protect survival of student athletes and really older non-student athletes. So this showed us that, you know, the parents and the grandparents in the uh, bleachers are at a higher risk for dying than the student athletes on the course. So we need to keep that in mind when we're talking about to screen or not to screen, that the real bread and butter is actually in what we do when we have an event, because they're going to happen. And I've just flashed a, um, a program on the screen called Project Adam. It has nothing to do with my first name. This was started in Wisconsin by a student athlete in high school named Adam, who died on the court. Um, because there was not a defibrillator. So AEDs for your, just as a quick digression, came into um, really commercial practice back in the late 90s. He died in 1997, I believe, uh, 1996 or 1987, or 1996 or 1997 um, of uh, a fatal arrhythmia. Um, and there is a program that we're actually uh, in the process of bringing an affiliate to Indiana um, that really deals with getting AEDs in schools and training uh, students as well as uh, everyone in that school on how to use them with the idea that we know, regardless of whether we're doing quality history and physical evaluation um, 
we're still going to miss students and that's not acceptable just because we miss them to let them die on the court if we can do anything about it. So this is the current state um, going back to the, the history side of thing. The American Heart Association recommends this 12 point screen. The medical history includes exertional chest pain, unexplained syncope, excessive exertional or unexplained dyspnea fatigue associated with exercise, prior recognition of a heart murmur, elevated systemic blood pressure. In the family history, we wanna look at premature death, disability from heart disease under 50 years of age, specific knowledge of certain cardiac conditions, and then ultimately in the physical examination, a heart murmur, femoral pulses to exclude an aortic coarctation, physical stigmata of Marfan syndrome or brachial artery uh, blood pressure in the sitting position. And if you're doing this, this is what you should be doing at a minimum, okay? Because if any of these gets flagged, they need to move on at a minimum for additional evaluation. So I'm going to conclude by basically hammering home on that. This is the program to start with on your screen. If you are moving forward with an ECG, that's fine. You know, ultimately you're a provider and you've got that, um, uh, you know, aut autonomous practice that you need to um, be an advocate for your patient. Whether you're going to spread this as a either community-wide screening program or so forth, the real key is to know the risks and benefits of that, but always to have that low threshold for ECGs because ECGs will identify individuals, but always every patient needs this. Many patients, um, and some would advocate all patients deserve an ECG. Moving forward, we need to educate our family and community, and lastly, and most importantly, we need to be prepared for those kiddos in the classroom, on the court, who are going to have events, whether we do all of this, whether we do ECGs, whether we do echocardiograms, these kiddos are going to be on the court and they're going to be at risk. Um, so that is really the take home message. And I'm going to leave you with one more video. Again, this is 2016, two years before Zeke died on a professional basketball court. This is a Project Adam school back in Atlanta, Georgia. And this is what happened. two games that night. I was in a lot of pain, which I was used to because I've been playing in pain the entire season. You could tell that she was laboring somewhat, um, but Claire just has the heart of a champion and she's just going to keep playing. When I was sitting at the scorer's table, she didn't score for the game, and then I just heard a loud thud. I think we just started yelling for help. Yeah, yelling 911. feeling of helplessness. It was very quickly that there was people there with us, very quickly. She fell about right here. Starting back in 2006, we, our school got the first AED. As part of that training, we would come together and we would have drills um, unannounced. Because of the code blue drills, there were some things that were just instinctual to me. The AED is literally right outside of those doors. Go grab the AED, bring it back and get to work. You, you really Error. can't describe yeah, can't. just the fear you had going through your mind. It really looks like they were running the drill. That it was so quickly that people were declared and that they were taking care of her and it was amazing. She was in VFib and so the only thing that would bring her heart back into a viable rhythm was to have a shock. The AED was needed in order to bring her back to life. It's complete joy seeing her revived. I'm just really thankful and I feel really blessed that this is where I was chosen to go to school at. And it's really thankful. We know that God created her and he knew about this moment before it happened. And he knew who would be here and what the outcome would be and then what we would be responsible to do going forward to share her story. Well, we wouldn't let our child participate in a sport anywhere at this point if there wasn't an AAD machine accessible. Waiting until someone's gone is not a good time.
so she just graduated college and she actually just got married. Um, so we can really do well by our patients. I don't want you to be afraid of uh, the next patient that comes in your clinic um, to get evaluated. You know what to do, you know how to take care of them. Um, but I would definitely uh, encourage you to embrace the, the data, embrace the literature um, and continue to take care of our patients the way you know how to. So with that, I will shut up and uh, welcome your questions. A lot of silence. I don't know whether people are silencing themselves or uh, I've answered everything. Hi, Dr. Keene. Um, I'm a second year resident. I uh, just had a quick question. As far as the prevalence of, um, you know, sudden, sudden cardiac events in Indiana, do you know kind of where we lie as far as um, our population here? Yeah, so we don't have quantitative data that I would uh, necessarily uh, hang my hat on, largely because we don't have a centralized repository for that. Uh, you know, when anyone dies, uh, and this is sort of a larger discussion, uh, it is uh, reported, of course, through the county coroners, and then the county coroners um, may uh, or may not share the cause of death and so forth with the state. It's not required that they do that unless obviously now, and I didn't even touch on COVID needless to say, it's, it's the only presentation that you probably haven't heard of and I just broke that, uh, the COVID uh, uh, in the past eight months, but um, certain diagnoses of course are reportable, um, but not all of them. So we don't have a, a good numerator for that. Um, often, uh, news uh, will cover these things if the parents or families are interested in doing so. There was a tragedy that happened uh, in Brownsburg at the beginning of the school year in August where a cross-country runner uh, went down and uh, died. Um, so it is clearly not zero, um, but I, I don't have a specific number out of that 100,000 numerator, excuse me, 100,000 denominator to share with you. Dr. King, can you hear me? Uh, I can. It's a, it's a little faint, but I, I can hear you. Okay. I'll stay out closer to the microphone. Um, for these screening exams that we're doing, are we supposed to be using a different threshold for murmurs for further workup than usual? So if I could sort of read between the lines, you know, if you've decided whether this is a uh, an important versus an unimportant murmur, is, is that sort of the, the question? In other words, if you've been following this kiddo for a while and you've already adjudicated that the murmur is normal or, sorry, uh, physiologic in the sense that it's coming from either uh, just vibratory uh, stills type phenomenon um, versus a murmur that is potentially pathologic, is, it, is that what we're trying to distinguish? Yeah. Yeah, so I think the key is whether or not, uh, to a certain extent, this is a quote, new murmur, meaning either new to you or new to the family. Um, if this is a kiddo who you've been following, uh, you know, throughout the entire uh, growth and development, you may have already adjudicated it with an echo, then that's fine. You do not need to recreate the wheel and get a, uh, an echo every year or get a new um, uh, EKG every year if you've already recognized this murmur is due to X reason and it's being uh, worked up adequately. If it is, however, brand new, you've either never taken care of the individual before, the parents don't know anything about it, I would categorically push them on for additional evaluation. All right, well, we're uh, at one o'clock and I, uh, I try to keep uh, things time, timely. So uh, 
so we're not keeping you over. Um, needless to say, if there are additional questions, concerns, or uh, things you want to review, I'm, I'm pretty reachable. It's just akeen at iu.edu, um, and I'm more than happy to uh, interface on, uh, on uh, and any level. So uh, thanks for uh, uh, watching, and uh, look forward to uh, collaborating with you uh, moving forward in your careers. Thanks, Dr. Keen. Appreciate it. Take care. Thank you so much.